My name is Chloe, and this is the Feeder Flow Podcast, where you'll find authentic conversations on how to get your period back and restore your metabolism from years of disordered eating, low calorie diets, and excessive exercise regimes. No trendy diets of celery juice and broccoli sprouts will be found here. Rather, my mission is to teach you balance and how the foods you've most likely cut out of your diet are the very ones that are essential for health. It's time we stop fearing food and embrace all that it can do for us. Food freedom, vivacious health, and a monthly menstrual cycle is possible. And I'm going to show you how to achieve this type of wellness without obsession. Corey, I love that you are someone who is really against diet culture and doing trendy things like Whole30 and AIP and the keto and intermittent fasting and all of that. Yet you were someone who understands the importance of nutrition. Like, I feel like we have two different camps. We have like the anti-diet culture camp and then diet culture camp. And I feel like within the anti-diet culture camp, we can get people who kind of just like throw their hands up in the air and like, you know, forget about nutrition. Let's just eat like donuts all day. That doesn't matter. We don't, you know, we're not going to really pay attention to what we eat, but then there is a side that's like, wait a minute, (laughs) we do care about (laughs) nutrition. We just understand that restrictive dieting and eating an oil-free kale salad for breakfast, lunch, and dinner is not the true definition of health. So I love that you really do speak about like how we can, especially as women, really nourish ourselves while having food freedom and eating intuitively. Mm, That's a really good point. I hadn't thought about it that way. I talk about the concept of outsourcing our responsibility a lot. Um, I see a lot in, you know, motherhood and it's just something that I've learned as I've gone of like, whoa, we as a culture outsource a lot to other people. So I see it as a balance of like taking the responsibility into your own hands. Cause what you just said about like the anti-diet culture and people that just throw their hands up, I totally see that as like, Hey, this is too overwhelming for my brain. And I'd rather just like not think about it, you know, not worry about it. Some of that can be kind of like a trauma response, but I think putting the power back into your own hands and putting simple steps in front of you is truly the key. And like, getting that back and like, you know, reconnecting to our ability to know what's best for our body. Yeah. And you know, for the listeners here, I just want to share that, like in the beginning, when I kind of got out of diet culture, it was a little bit throwing my hands up in the air. And that was really healing for me, honestly, to be like, you know, I just need to eat churros and cake and all these things. And I just need to not have like a negative response to it. But after kind of really healing uh, my relationship with food and really getting out of energy debt and healing my metabolism, I did step back into, okay, I got to really nourish my body and really pay attention to the food that I'm eating, not in an orthorexic obsessed way. And that's what the like, you know, putting my hands up in the air allowed me to finally get to that point where it's like, okay, I can like see this differently now. Um, And I can nourish my body and understand nutrition and what's going to support my metabolism And I can go out to dinner with anyone and eat whatever's on the table because I'm not obsessed about it. And I don't kind of correlate my self-worth with what I am eating, but Mm -hmm. yeah, it doesn't mean you throw it away. So I think you just, I wanted to just say thank you because I think you do a really good job at sharing the importance of taking care of your body without it being another rule or another diet that someone has to follow. Oh yeah. And I, By the way, I mean, I I relate to a lot of your audience in that I totally did used to struggle with orthorexic thoughts with tracking macros and counting calories. I had done one bodybuilding competition back in the day and it's no way, really? Yes. I could not imagine you doing that. I know, right? It's so opposite of what I everything that I I believe in. Corey now is like long, beautiful. I mean, she's long hair like me, like long, beautiful, curly hair, lives in Hawaii, um, has like beautiful kids, is always just super natural, no makeup. So that's really surprising to hear that you did a I know because body like bodybuilding culture is, you know, breast implants, lots of makeup, bleach your hair, spray tans. Like it's just, it's crazy how different it is. And I, yeah, I had done one just for fun. Cause I was just like, we'll see. Like, I, I bet I could do pretty well if I, if I go do this and I, I did it in a way that was not super restricted. The lowest my calories were, were about 1800 or 1750. Like when I was Which is getting- restrictive, but still, still, still very restrictive. And I had 
like going through that experience and then reverse dieting afterwards. So like slowly increasing my calories up from there. I had such a fear of binging after that because my cravings were like through the roof. I mean, even though that was, it's not like I was eating 1200 calories a day, but for me and the activity level that I needed or that my body was going through at the time, it was very restrictive for me. I was craving everything. It was very hard for me to slowly reverse diet. And that is actually what triggered um, just like obsessiveness with my macros and not being able to eat out because I didn't know if it would, you know, fall within the, the category of my macros. And um, it took a little while for me to get out of that. I think I was doing that for a full year back in like, I think it was 2015. Um, so about six years ago. So, oh my gosh, seven years ago now, because we're in 2022. Um, but yeah, I just totally relate to all the feelings of just obsessive, like orthorexic thoughts when it comes to your food. And I love living in this, in this freedom now. That's why I'm so passionate about it now. I know it's like someone asked me the other day they're like why do you do what you do I'm like trust me I do what I do because like I know how awful it is <laughs> but like there's no way I could sit here with this amount of freedom and like not share it with other people like that just felt a little wrong to me um, and I know not everyone who goes through this journey ends up wanting to share about it but I know for me personally it was like oh no people have to understand that like restricting is not the way to go. I am kind of curious though, Corey, when you left uh, the bodybuilder competition and you started like reverse dieting, how did your body respond to that? Like, did you gain weight pretty quickly coming out of that? Like what happened here? Um, because I was OCD careful about it. I actually did not gain any fat coming out of it. I mean, really, I only just slowly gained I mean, I would say muscle and fat, but and it's funny with bodybuilding competitions, the culture is you go diet. I mean, you diet for 12 weeks. Um, maybe you diet even more than that, but then right after your competition, you go out to eat and you order everything on the menu and you wake up 10 pounds heavier. And it's like, it's like, it's like a joke. It's like a, an inside joke. And there are memes about it. And it's I'm like, a joke. And yet like so many people I've worked with a lot of girls who come from that kind of background and it is like traumatizing what happens. Mm -hmm because mm -hmm. they can't stop. And I'm like, this is why you never want to restrict because you have to naturally bounce back the other way. Yeah, exactly. And I find that that's what, had I not realized what was happening afterwards and like kind of just how restrictive I had gotten in my mindset with like, food wasn't even fun for me anymore. Like I don't, life was not even fun because I was so obsessed with, all I could think about was what, what is my next meal going to be? What is the macro balance going to be? is all the food can be available to me. Um, I don't want to go over my macros. Like it, it just revolved around that. And I realized how much it was affecting my lifestyle, but I realized, had I not realized that I would have gotten into a, an addiction of like the cut bulk, cut bulk. Like, you know, where you do that every single year. Go ahead. I am so glad that you brought this up. I've never once talked about this before, but the whole cutting and bulking thing people see it as, oh, you're being athletic. Oh, you're doing these competitions, X, Y, and Z. And it looks like something that's healthy and promoted as something that's healthy. And I'm just seeing it as a big controlled restrict and binge. Like that's all it is. hundred percent. Yeah. You are, you are exactly right. It is, there is such an emotional and mental component of that, that people aren't realizing. And I think it's a way of people being able to express, um, a need to control their lives, you know, especially when people have, are under a, a period of stress, they're like, they can, they can express control over their food, right? It's an easy thing to control. Macros are an easy thing to control if you make yourself do it. And so to be honest, I realized I had a control problem and that was, that was what I actually had to really address and, and, and understand why I felt the need to control my food um, and why I felt like I needed to control the way my body looked. And really it was just so much about like, what other people thought about me and what my, even what my husband thought about me. I just cared so much about how he saw me as opposed to I'm doing this because I feel good. I'm doing this because I'm nourishing my body. I mean, I just, I had to divorce myself from a lot of those, those old thoughts. So you knew your husband when you were going through all of this, and then you went through this kind of transformative process with him there. How was that? Like, what did he think about you when you were going through this like crazy macro tracking time? Well, it's funny because my libido was shot during my dieting period, right? So for 12 weeks, I was um, irritable. I was, I had no libido, libido. I was moody, you know, irritable. And 
also just the idea that we couldn't just go out on a date night. Um, this was pre kids and we lived in the city. We lived in Texas back then in Houston and we couldn't just go out on a night on the town and like go get sushi and like a drink somewhere because I was like, I don't know how that's going to fit into my macros. And I was so, um, I was just so obsessed with it and it didn't stop there because again, this continued after the competition was over because I was so scared to gain weight, um, post competition that I was, I was still, you know, so OCD about it. So I would say it affected our marriage for a, like a solid five, five or six months that I was, that I was in that just, um, control phase and, and still so irritable because it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily that I was moody as a result of low calories once my calories were back up, but I would get irritable and triggered if I was in a situation where I didn't have control over my food. Um, so it was a lot that we, that we went through in our marriage where, to be honest, I don't think that my husband said much about it because I don't think that guys have a lot of words to put to the situation when they watch a woman go through this because they themselves may have watched their mom go through it. And um, not necessarily like a bodybuilding competition, but just like they may have watched their mom diet their whole lives. And so they're like, this is normal. This is, this is, this is, this is at home for me. You know, like it's, you know, nothing's wrong. It's sad to think that the like normal thing for a woman is to diet, hate her body, always trying to be like losing weight or shape shifting. Like really sad to see that that has become the norm. Exactly. I mean, growing up even, I mean, this is, I'm not saying anything's wrong with this, but just like the idea of a scale being in your bathroom and just watching your mom weigh herself every morning in the bathroom, you know? And, um, so we, part of me divorcing myself from, from all of that was just getting rid of my scale, you know, because I, I just didn't want the, like the culture of a scale in my house, if yeah. that makes sense. So if you don't have a scale though, how do you know if you're healthy? That's a great question. Cause I feel like that is the one thing that people, not the one, there's many things that people have to, you know, kind of step away from and maybe unlearn on their, on their health journeys. Um, because I used to use a scale as a really in my mind, I thought it was a great tool because I was like, Hey, I can measure my progress as I track macros and I can make sure that I'm, um, you know, gaining an appropriate amount of weight in an appropriate amount of time. But, um, I did not know how to connect and be in tune with my body and how it feels and how to track metabolic markers and all the things that you probably talk about now. I didn't know what any of that was like just being just, just the ability to like ask myself, does this meal feel nourishing to me, you know, do, do, do I sleep well at night? You know, I didn't have any connection in attunement to that until I threw away my scale. Mm. Yeah. It gets us to think that that's the one metric that matters when yeah. in reality, there are so many, like a long list of things that you should be looking at to determine whether your body is at a healthy weight. And you, mm -hmm. like you mentioned, sleep hair is one, your libido is one digestion is the other, um, just mental clarity. So throughout the day, if you find yourself completely brain fogged or, um, irritable, things like that, like that's all a sign that your body's just not at a happy place. Mm -hmm. so the best thing for you to do at that point is not to go and try and restrict more and control your diet more. Rather, it's to really understand that you are undernourishing your body and you need to be adding more to your plates and you need to not be just eating kale salads all day. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So you went through this journey of endometriosis. Uh, can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, to be honest, it actually got at its worst um, after the bodybuilding competition. Um, so during a time of, so I got off of birth control. I was on birth control for a year in our first year marriage, got off of birth control, did the bodybuilding competition. So dieted after being so mineral and nutrient depleted from the pill and mineral dysregulated. And, and then I went on this diet. Um, and then following that I was, yeah, endometriosis, the way it like manifested in my body was, you know, painful periods, heavy bleeding. Um, and then as each month progressed, I started noticing that growth was happening on other organs. So I started having, you know, horrible pain with bowel movements. Um, and like, that's another sign of like, okay, maybe something is attaching to the, the colon area or the intestines area. area. Um, the painful periods for me were enough to completely, I mean, I was on the bathroom floor blacking out. I was throwing up from pain. It was the most excruciating. I'm, I'm, I've been so out of it now that I forget how horrific it was, but I've, that was the only time in my life that I 
struggle with suicidal thoughts because I was in such an, an astronomical amount of pain that I didn't realize, I didn't think I could go on like that. Um, and then, you know, the only options I was given for endometriosis were birth control, getting pregnant or having a hysterectomy. Um, and they're like, what you'll typically hear, I think maybe at a conventional doctor is, well, you know, do you want to go ahead and get pregnant now? Some women, you know, find that they healed, you know, just from pregnancy alone. We like weren't ready. Hormone get- reset. <laughs> Once your body yeah, goes something through like that. Yeah. I haven't even looked into it enough. Cause I'm just like, what even is that? Um, I do know a couple people that they that have found relief through that, but in my mind, I'm like, if my body is so out of balance right now, so out of balance that it is like, has this, this amount of symptoms that are showing up in my body, isn't that a good enough sign that my body is not ready to get pregnant? You know, how would I possibly nourish a oh, baby? Wait, I want you to like repeat that again. You guys, that was so important right there. She's yes. pretty much saying if my body was giving me signs and symptoms of imbalance and I'm unhealthy, why would I want to get pregnant at that point? Totally. Super, super key to understand. Cause I know a lot of girls, they're like, I'll just do IVF, which I'm not dissing IVF or any of that, but a lot of like, even just gynecologists, that's the one option they'll give you. We'll put you on birth control until you want to get pregnant. And then we will, you know, just do IVF to get you pregnant. But you have to take a step back and go, there's a reason why my body doesn't want to be pregnant right now. Exactly. And so it's getting a- pregnant artificially may pose risk to you and to your baby. hundred percent. And I'm so glad I had, the intuition at the time to know that, but only afterward, only years later, as I learned more about what endometriosis even is, I'm like, I am so glad that I did not get pregnant. I don't even know if I would have been able to carry a pregnancy. I think I would have seen a miscarriage happen between six to eight weeks because I, my body wouldn't have been producing enough progesterone. I was so estrogen dominant. I had, I was so iron overloaded, um, so nutrient depleted. And I, yeah, I just, I was so thankful to um, just have that, you know, intuition to be like, something's not right about this. And so, um, yeah, I found a holistic practitioner who actually was able to nail down what I know now as just a broken metabolism. And at the time he was like, all right, let's look at your liver. Your liver is super sluggish. Um, you've got a lot of estrogen dominance going on. Um, you are mineral dysregulated. I mean, everything that I know now about the metabolism, like it's, it was, it was so clear to me. It's so clear to me looking back on like what all was going on. Yeah. Um, I was kind of the same way. I was like, my hair is falling out. Why is my hair falling out? And I look at it now. I'm like, you weren't eating anything. Yes. It's so, Your it's hair so, falling out. <laughs> it's so eye-opening and clear once you understand the bigger picture. And I, I, I know, you know, this, cause you wouldn't be teaching this on your platform. If you weren't just like, guys, it's so simple. Once you understand objectively, just zoom out for a second, figure out what's going on. Um, and so, yeah, my practitioner back then actually attacked it with really strategic supplements. I, knowing what I know now, I'm like, oh my gosh, it was really my lifestyle that was allowing for this to happen. It was the way I was eating. Um, and so learning about the metabolism is why I set the lifestyle in place to never regress back into endometriosis. But I did see a lot of progress with strategic supplements for that. However, issues were ha- you know, showing up down the road in other ways because I still wasn't setting the thriving lifestyle for my metabolism to you know, be in balance. Um, but that is how I addressed my endometriosis was not getting on birth control and not getting pregnant, but actually addressing the crazy estrogen dominance that my body was under from birth control. And I'm sure from years prior, you know, drinking soy milk and almond milk and all the, all the things. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my story with endometriosis. And it's funny cause I, I don't actually share a lot about it now. It's funny cause that like, that is literally what led into my health journey. I've talked about it in my podcast. I've talked about it before you know, in little areas, but I find that anytime that I talk about this online, the amount of just people do not like when you talk about this. Um, there are, you know, huge accounts dedicated to, um, not dedicated, but just, there are a lot of accounts that when they see like more of a holistic approach, um, on Instagram, they'll share it on their page and they'll like, you know, tell their, their team of people to go attack that page. And, um, I, think I just think it's to me with the vegans, the vegans, I, come, they I all totally attack at the same time. They all get their little friends to come and to comment on my post. Exactly. It's like, if it's either in their stories or a telegram account, but people love to send their dogs to sick their dogs on you when they don't like something that you're posting. And I'm like, it, 
it's really honestly so upsetting to me because I'm like, all that I'm doing is trying to show women how to find healing. And the fact that you are, you are, you know, not allowing this to happen because you just don't like that this is different than what you were taught in medical school, you know, um, it's really, it's really upsetting. I'm, I'm sure there will be a time and a place where I talk more about it in the future, but it's funny because I haven't, I haven't talked about it in a while. Hmm. Interesting. And you're completely symptom free now, right? Yeah. I've been symptom free for, I guess so that was, that was 2017. Whenever I finally was like completely healed. Um, I have no reservations of, of over saying the word healed. I guess the politically correct term would be like, I put my disease in remission, but um, I, that was back in 2017. So I guess that's now been, you know, almost five years now, um, that I've been symptom free and it's just amazing. Like just what you can see your body do when you put it, you know, into balance and allow for healing. We are all created with the ability to heal. So just being able to let that innately happen when you set the right environment for it is just so, um, mind blowing. I've seen in my comp in my community, sorry. Um, just kind of a low morale at times of thinking that like I've gone too far I've like wrecked my body too much that I will like never get my hormones balanced I will never have like a strong metabolism ever again and I'm just curious I mean obviously your story shows otherwise but I'm curious your thoughts on like on just kind of that morale of like wow I've really trashed my metabolism here I'm never going to be able to just like eat normally again or um, just maintain a healthy weight Totally. I think that there is a beautiful balance in between where number one, you are recognizing your story, right? You're able to observe it and take ownership for it because you do have to take ownership for it. And I, I'm actually, if people are struggling with this, that means that they are taking ownership for their health. And they're like, that's already like slow clap to you. If that is you, because you've already taken like the hardest step for people to be able to get themselves to do, which is, Whoa, I got to take ownership for my health. Okay, here we go. And then they get overwhelmed with oh my gosh, like, what have I done? <laughs> like, look at these choices that I've made that have slowly put my body into imbalance. Um, but that is where you have to find the balance between, okay, I can heal. I'm created to heal. My body has the ability to innately heal. Um, I just have to step back and allow for this to happen. And so that's where I see, you know, small and sim simple and practical steps being, you know, how you get there. But I do think that, on the flip side, like I said, like being able to even observe and take ownership for your story is such an important part of the healing process and being able to self experiment from there and see the healing and put the hard work in. Cause if we got like, if we were able to just press an easy button and be able to feel better tomorrow, it wouldn't be, um, it wouldn't be the same thing. We wouldn't, we wouldn't, we wouldn't believe so strongly in what we've done and seen the fruit of it if it was so easy to achieve that healing but i think watching the body fall back into balance even though healing isn't linear um, but being able to watch the body fall back into balance is i think one of the most strengthening and empowering parts of a healing journey 100 percent. i say the same thing every time i'm like it's such a soul evolving soul growing like process that i wouldn't want to just give you a pill that's like here you go you're gonna be free <laughs> now like it sounds great and i wish freedom on everyone but i know that it was through my journey um that i learned about myself and i learned what it meant to truly have compassion for like my body and who i am and i really did learn to take radical responsibility over my health again and to accept the consequences that came with the actions that i took before um and that was kind of hard at first and it really made me angry in the beginning because i was like oh why did i do this and they became so clear why i went through everything and I was like, I can't believe I did this. I'm so stupid. But instead of like really just getting caught in that energy, I had to be like, okay, what's done is done, but I have the future ahead of me. So now mm -hmm. I can just accept the fact that I did those things. That was stupid. Don't do it again, Chloe. Like stop intermittent fasting. That was just not smart. And now I can move forward and it takes time to heal the body. This isn't like a now tomorrow, if you eat breakfast, you're going to be fine. This is an over the time process where you can strengthen your body back. But yeah, I, I'm really, I'm always really just awe-inspired when I see people go through something like amenorrhea or endometriosis or an eating disorder and they come out of it and they really, they just, they thrive. So speaking on the yeah. thriving, unless you have something to say, sorry. Well, the last thing I was going to say was just that like 
being able to put those steps in place and being able to connect to what your metabolic markers are, it also helps you strengthen um, your relationship with being able to know your physiology so well, because like, let's say you're doing all the things and you're getting frustrated because you're not seeing prog like you're not seeing progress at the rate that you maybe wanted to or want to. And so you throw your hands up and you go, well, I'm just going to go back to my old way of eating. But then what happens? Your digestion slows down, your hair starts falling out again. You start waking up at night again. And that's when you're like, oh my gosh, like this is just, this is it. Like this, is, I'm, I'm doing, I'm doing the right things. I just need to tr trust the process. Um, and that's why I love people like Living Roots Wellness, do you know who that is? Uh, Teresa, mm -hmm. she does like EFT tapping for mm -hmm. kind of like rewiring the system to be able to trust the process. And um, I, I practice a lot of that. I've, I found that to be a tremendous tool. Um, anything from therapy to just like brain rewiring to nervous system regulation, whether that's seeing a chiropractor or just understanding like how, what your nervous system needs to feel safe. I feel like those are all really important tools in learning how to trust the process and like you know, knowing that healing is not going to take, it's not going to happen overnight, but what were you going to say? Um, oh, I was just going to talk about, uh, this whole kind of concept of thriving and I would mm -hmm. love to kind of introduce the, uh, audience to kind of your philosophy with, okay, so how are we supposed to be nourishing our body? And not, that wasn't like a, how you quote unquote should, everyone has their own little iterations of that, but maybe share what you learned throughout this journey. Um, I love this question. I think that it's because it, I have such different answers for what I would have answered maybe, you know, six years ago or so. If somebody would have been like, what, what's like a thriving, healthy body? I would have been like a shredded, you know, like six pack. And um, I don't know. I think that's pretty much it. Like, I feel, I feel like that's like all, <laughs> thigh all, all, all thigh gap is in there too, usually. Thigh gap, six thigh pack. Thigh gap. Some, 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 some booty going on, but other than that, yeah, that's pretty much it. And, uh, I think I just, I saw health and thriving health as such a physical marker. And now I would describe it as someone that is warm, that has warmth in their body, um, wakes up warm and is able to see that they're warm. Their body is warming up, you know, after they eat each meal someone that their hair is not um, excessively shedding and falling out. I mean, these are, when you think about these objectively, they make so much sense for like, why would this be happening? You know, like why, why would these symptoms be happening if your body was in thriving health? So like, yeah, your hair not um, shedding and falling out all the time, being able to sleep through the night and wake up, not feeling like you got hit by a train, um, having a, go ahead. Oh, I just want to add one thing to that. Yeah. Also kind of flip side, because this is what I see more with my clients is they wake up with like an inordinate amount of energy because they're running high on cortisol. So yeah. there's like two different ways your body could go with this. Either you're super depleted and your body's just, I'm like bonking here and we're just going to be super fatigued. Or yeah. you're at that state where you're still just, you're running on adrenaline and cortisol and you feel super energetic all day. Um, it's but then funny you're tired and wired and you can't sleep at night. Uh, so yeah, anyways, hundred percent. When I, whenever I was doing my bodybuilding competition was the only time that I intermittent fasted. Um, and I started doing it about four weeks until the competition. So for four weeks, just overnight, I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to intermittent fast in the morning and have like a, I think I had like a 10 hour, 10 hour fast, which is not even that crazy, but it was enough for me to like, I, I woke up the next morning and then like started doing it. The next morning for the next four weeks, I woke up with a, an insane amount of energy and mental clarity. And I was like, I've made it like, clearly this is like the way we are supposed to feel. And then I look in the mirror one time and I'm like, where did those wrinkles come from on my face? And I had dark circles under my eyes and my face was like losing its color. Um, and it's just insane. Like it's, it's insane how we think something is healthy. Um, but the rest of our body is just screaming at us that we're just like, what are you doing? Can I, I want to, um, share one of the posts that you did actually, I, before we got on the call, I just, I always like to scroll through everyone's thing just to get like a good idea of maybe what we want to talk about. And you had this one post that I kept up here on my screen. Cause I was like, I really want to talk about this, but I you said it. pretty much it's the one. So you have a picture of water and you have words above the water and you say what we see when we go on a restrictive diet. And you see energy and mental clarity, less bloating and less inflammation and weight loss. So that's like what you see, but then you have 
underneath the body, you say, you say uh, what we might not see. And you say reproductive uh, stress, decreased stomach acid, gut bacterial overgrowth, chronically elevated stress hormones, leaky gut, impaired liver detoxification, hormone imbalance, suppressed thyroid and metabolism, nutrient and min mineral depletion. Sorry, that was really small, so I couldn't read that. Um, but I love this because so many people, they come to me and they're like, but I went on a juice cleanse and I had so much energy and I was feeling so <laughs> great. <laughs> um, but then they have all these other things going on. Can you like explain your thoughts on all of this? I thought it was a great post, by the way. Yeah, yeah it was basically, you know, I made that post when we came out. I came out with a podcast episode with my co-host on breaking down the popular diets. So we kind of what you discussed in the very beginning of the episode, you know, AIP, Whole30, Paleo, whatever it is, just like the diets that people go on for quote healing. So like they're healing their bodies and they're going to go on these diets. And what you hear a lot, especially even with keto is like, well, I lost a bunch of weight with keto and I felt amazing. And I'm like, well, describe amazing. Like, what is, what do you mean by that? Like, what do you mean by, by amazing? And they're like, well, I had a ton of energy. And I'm like, we, there are such clear, um, and common symptoms that people talk about on how they feel when they go on a diet, but really they're only looking at those markers. It's like, I had energy, I had mental clarity, I lost weight as if those are the most important and the only important well, marker. And you know? it could be a sign though of ill health. If you think about it, weight loss too quickly is really like traumatic for the body. Having just energy could be you just living on stress hormones. Yeah. Feeling less bloated could just be you're destroying your digestive system, but you've restricted so much that, you know, you've mitigated the response of uh, like a flare up of bloating or anything. This doesn't mean that you're healthy. You kind exactly. of Exactly. Just... Exactly. In my, in my course, I give the example of like, um, I was telling a story one time how I was surfing and my son was on the surfboard. And, and like, before we went out there, I was like, do we put a life jacket on? Mm. And he was like maybe a year and a half and a wave was coming and he jumps off of the, of the surf, surfboard, like right as the wave was crashing. And I, thankfully I was able to grab him, but I was describing like, like picture yourself in a scenario like that, where your adrenaline is like pumping and like, it's kind of like, um, that's like the best way you can get people to understand like how, yeah, you can feel a huge burst of energy and you can actually see clear and like hear clear in those moments. But it's, it's like the same thing as like running from a bear or like being in any kind of heightened state of adrenaline and cortisol, just because you have more energy does not mean that it, that your body wants to stay like that at all times. It's going to over time, slowly kill you. So, um, it's intense. Yeah. And you have to start looking for all those things underneath the water that start creeping up. And those are your big signs that like, yeah, this isn't as healthy or supportive as you maybe thought it to be. And unfortunately, I mean, just to add one more thing to that, um, unfortunately in like kind of the mainstream alternative health community, there aren't a lot of people that are, um, pinpointing each of those things that you listed below the water as like having one common denominator. It's kind of like they'll stay on their keto diet, but then, you know, if like SIBO comes up over time, they're like, oh, that's unrelated to my diet. That's just like something that happened. So let me just go get on these, um, you know, supplements and like, yeah. And it's just, it's, it's not fixing the root cause of it. And so I don't know if a lot of people have the understanding and it's kind of what, you know, you and me are trying to do and educate people on is there is a common denom denominator. All of these things actually work together and they're just symptoms that your body is so undernourished. And so just understanding a physiologically appropriate way of eating, you can just avoid so many of these, these issues. Mm. And, and what is, and you don't have to go into extreme detail, but maybe give a quick recap for those who are maybe uh, new to my stuff, new to your stuff, and they don't really know what would be like a metabolically supportive way to eat. Because to someone, first off, when they hear the word metabolism, they immediately think weight and Corey and I are talking about your actual metabolism, which means how fast and efficient your cells are transforming food into energy and utilizing it. So it really has nothing to, I don't want to say nothing to do with your weight, but weight is such a teeny, tiny, mm -hmm. small part of your uh, metabolism. Um, and when you do restrictive diets and over-exercise and go through an eating disorder specifically too, um, you'll have a low metabolic rate. You kind of trash your metabolism. Mm -hmm. So what would be 
the meaning of eating in a way that's metabolically supportive. So, and yeah, this is like so all encompassing, but I'll give you a couple examples um, just so it's easy to digest for the listeners. But if you think about it, even just from like an observational way. So like, let's just use like observation for a second in nature. You probably have heard if you guys are listening, maybe the example of the nuts and seeds thing of like, what, you know, what do, what do animals eat that are ready to hibernate for the winter? What do they gravitate towards? They gravitate towards tons and tons and tons and tons of nuts. And so if you take a, like a squirrel, for example, or a bear, um, the kinds of foods that they eat to slow their metabolisms down by 50% to be able to sleep, you know, during hibernation. And interestingly, when they wake up from hibernation, they're in like a diabetic state. And so those foods alone can give us a hint and a glimpse without even studying the chemical, you know, the, the chemistry of those foods, you know, what kind of foods would be more appropriate for our metabolism or slow down the metabolism. So if you think about the summertime, um, when we have abundant, you know, ripe fruits available to us, that is when a lot of us, our metabolism, our metabolisms are running very efficiently. And so if you think about, okay, well, what kind of foods are available during the summertime that aren't necessarily available in the wintertime, um, you can kind of start to like piece those together, right? So when you think of like summertime foods, you think of ripe honey and fresh fruits and all of these things are so um, nourishing to the cells of your body because our run, our, our cells run on, our bodies run on glucose. And so all of us have probably taken like a, you know, eighth grade biology class or, you know, opened up a physiology book at some point and learned that our bodies run on glucose, but then we get into diet culture and it's like, no, we should run on fats, you know, fat as fuel. And what you I, I just, I never got the whole being against fruit thing. Never. <laughs> I don't throughout all the th- diets I did, even like when I went keto, I was like, this is stupid. I can't eat a mango. Like, this is just like <laughs> it's just not fun. Think about it. It's not, it's not enjoyable and it's not sustainable. And I mean, even if you just think of sustainability, I feel like that even, if, even in itself can answer so much about what your body craves. Um, because can you really see yourself like not having carbs for the rest of your life? Like a lot of people would say no. So then like, why go on a diet that requires something of you that's not sustainable for life? Like let's create sustainability and consistency and safety to the body. And so what we want to do is create safety and consistency and also nourish the body at a cellular level. And so I think carbs is just the easiest example for people to think of because, um, you know, we've just gone through all many, like all these different diet trends over the years where sugar is bad and then coconut oil is bad. And we hear about these things all the time, but if we really think about, okay, what are, what are our cells actually need? And, you know, how does the liver work? I think like one of the best ways that women can educate themselves is honestly just studying the physiology of the liver how the liver stores glucose, how gluconeogenesis works and how it has to, your body has to elevate stress hormones to break down its own reserves to provide glucose for your body if we're not eating enough carbs. But what else do we need with the carbs? We need protein um, with the carbs to get the the glucose where it needs to go. And so even just studying something as simple as the organ, the liver, um, I feel like we can learn so much about, okay, this is what our body needs. It needs an abundance of protein. It needs an abundance of carbs. Go ahead. Well, yeah, no, I love everything that you're saying. I just want to add in there. It needs not just protein, but it needs specific amino acids and it needs bioavailable protein. So cute. <laughs> All right, she came in to nurse. Can you get a nurse? Um, maybe she's not. I don't know. She's distracted now. I can, you could probably keep talking and we could like, no, no, you're great. You're great. Yeah. Um, I was going to say here, oh, so your body needs not just any protein, but it needs specific amino acids and also it needs it in a bioavailable form. So going back to kind of nuts and seeds, what you're talking about, you know, I'm all for food freedom. I'm all for eating everything. And I don't like religiously take nuts and seeds out of my diet, but I came from a vegan background where I was eating nut cheeses, drinking nut milks, making like scones out of almond uh, meal and all of that. It was like nuts galore. And I really learned, you know, I was thinking at the time I'm eating so much protein. This is so good. (laughs) I really learned that that was first off completely just 
disrupting my gut. Um, second off, it wasn't even providing my body the amino acids that it really needed to thrive specifically for my liver so that it can create more T4 so that I can have a higher metabolism. I mean, my whole course is like dedicated to like teaching that one like aspect. I know okay. yours is as well um, because it is so important when you understand the importance of really taking care of your liver and your thyroid. Um, and so, yeah, the idea of like when you're just eating copious amounts of nuts and seeds, you're just suppressing your metabolism. And then we see like the vegan community all out there being like nuts and seeds, everything. Like we're making everything out of nuts and seeds. And I just look at that and I'm like, oh, that's so just against nature. Like I would never go out to an almond tree and just pick like 300 almonds and just eat it. But when I eat almond butter, I can go through half the jar and that's like a lot of almonds. And that's not going to be the best thing for your body. Yeah. And I was going to say what you just said about like, whenever you're eating in concentrated forms like that, like nut butter and almond flutter or flour, almond mm. meal, um, you don't realize the quantity and like how it just gets so out of hand and it just doesn't even make sense. You're saying like on a, on a, does it even make sense mm. with nature? Sorry. Um, Lori has her little baby here. And she's, <laughs> she's what, like five months old. That's exactly how old she is. Yes. That's a good guess. Um, I'm surrounded yeah, by it, babies right now, so I'm kind of used to it. I know you are. Um, yeah, with the nuts thing, it's also just like, man, like if we just think about the fact that we are warm bodies and if polyunsaturated fatty acids are less stable fats and they easily oxidize in the, in the presence of light and heat and oxygen, and they, you know, make up so many of the fatty acids of like these cold water fish but like, we're not cold water fish. We're warm humans that live above the ground. And so we have to realize that our bodies thrive on more stable fats, meaning saturated fats. And, um, even that just alone, just like, just thinking about like, I'm a warm human body, you know, and nuts and seeds and in moderation, totally go for it. But, um, demonizing saturated fats is just such a strange, it's, it's that that I hate. It's not that <laughs> someone ate like a nut and seed. It's more that they like will refuse to eat actual cheese because they're afraid of the saturated fat. Um, and so then they, you know, cook in canola oil and uh, use all these nuts and seeds. An interesting point that you kind of just brought up is that idea of like, we are different from other animals. And again, coming from a vegan background, I think this was something that I had to really understand is that like a cow, while it grazes on grass each day, and I'm like looking at that as a vegan and being like, well, I just need to start grazing on grass. Like that's what I should be doing. <laughs> right. Um, but when you really understand that like a cow is a ruminant animal and they have what, like eight stomachs, they have a completely different digestive system to us. It, it just, it makes no sense sense for me to go like this is what a cow's eating so I need to be eating that so we all have to be looking at like okay I am a human I'm a fish I'm a cow like we have to be eating our like human specific diseases and I don't know for me when I look at kind of just vegan diet I just it seems just so unnatural to our human species like we are omnivores we eat everything we eat the meat we eat the fruit we eat it all and to just kind of only pick one side I feel like is just I don't know it's just not really smart in my mind and everyone knows my opinions on this but at this point oh, but for sure. I always think it's so fascinating to to listen and hear from the person who probably used to think the vegan diet was the most natural <sighs> but then realized <sighs> you know nature alone actually allowed you to realize that an omnivorous diet was the most natural. I don't know. It's just so interesting that the more connected I have gotten to nature over time, um, which is kind of the vegan thing is like, you know, connecting to nature. But I feel like the, I feel like the more connected I've been in nature over time, the more I have really solidified my, um, my observation of just like our need for saturated fats, no matter what the political, the political nutrition climate is. Yeah. Do you want to at all, Corey, mention the, um, the podcast that you did with Ellen Fisher? And I yeah. actually have yet to listen to it. So Ellen Fisher is this huge uh, vegan YouTuber. She's a lovely lady, lady from what I know. And Corey is actually a good friend with her and she lives out in Hawaii with her. Um, they did a podcast together 
Ellen is 100% vegan. Corey is more pro-metabolic uh, eater. So she definitely um, eats good quality uh, meat and animal products. And they had a podcast together sharing kind of maybe the similarities and the differences between uh, veganism and health and all that. I, I haven't listened to it yet. So I would just love to hear kind of summary what came out of that whole podcast. Because I know you guys weren't trying to like kill each other on that podcast you're trying to yeah. find like some similarities um but no, I'm curious yeah. how that went. and maybe you're kind of like two words that you would say kind of recapping like your overall thoughts on uh veganism Ooh, okay oh that's interesting I think my thoughts on veganism is that I I don't know if I could summarize it in two words but I would say like I completely empathize with the heart behind it like I totally get it um, I do believe that although, you know, a vegan listening to this is going to completely disagree with me and that's totally fine. We're all entitled to our own opinions. I, I think that, um, the vegan, um, I guess, outlook on life is a little bit of, um, I guess, picking little bits of things that make sense to them and resonate to them, um, and, or resonate most with them all in one encompassed, like, philosophy, if that makes sense. And so, you know, for example, it's very like Western medicine, um, kind of like politi politically correct to call saturated fats bad. But we've known for like, you know, just observing first off our ancestors, but secondly, just understanding the, um, just the, just the, the physiology of, like I said, our bodies and what our bodies need. We know that saturated fats are not toxic to our bodies if that was if that was the case then breast milk would be toxic to well to and it's like what what did we eat before <laughs> like you guys we've right. been for thousands of years we didn't have almond cheeses like a thousand years ago we ate exactly. meat, we ate dairy we ate eggs uh eggs actually eggs and meat are two of the you know foods that we've been eating the longest and then so it's funny when we hear like eggs are as dangerous as smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. I'm like, what on earth? Like, where did you get that? Totally. Yeah. And I think that like, if we want to use, I guess, academia to prove something, we can find something all day. You know, we can find a study all day to prove something that we believe about something. I'm more interested in um, unless the, unless the science was very, very clear, like, yeah, that's definitely one thing to consider, but it's one of those topics where you're going to find equal amount of studies on both sides talking about saturated fats, right? So what else do we have? We have observation, we have anecdotal experience, we have, um, the ability to study and see on our own bodies. Like we have the ability to self-experiment, right? And we have the ability to trust that, we can understand and decide what is best for our bodies. And so, you know, statistically, statistically, if we know that, I think it's about 90% of vegans go back to eat, eating meat at some point, is that right? Or is it like 80, 88? Surprised it's not a hundred, but. <laughs> I, think it, I think it's, I think it's, no, yeah, it, it's a high level. It's a high level. Mm -hmm. Cause three years ago it was 87. And then when, like before the interview, I had checked it again and I was like, oh, is it not? It was either 90 or 91. I was like, okay, so it's, apparently rising, which is interesting because we're seeing a big push for plant-based right now. We are, and we're yeah. seeing, you know, meatless burgers and beyond meat. And politically, we're seeing an, a, an environmental shift to try to rely more on, um, you know, plant-based eating. And um, I think that if, if, if a lot of money is going in there and we're still seeing a trend, I guess, still with people going back to eating meat, um, I think that is something to consider, you know, also. So I'm saying even that's just like research aside, like what else do we have in front of us? We have um, just the ability to see the impact of the diet in our own body. And from the experience that I've seen, um, I mean, you know, that interview came out, I think I had maybe my gosh, the, the first few days of the interview was out. I think my husband and I were sifting through like 70 to 80 emails a week, for, sorry, a day from people from that, from that interview who are going, I'm vegan. I feel like absolute trash. This is the first thing that has made sense to me. Like, what, what can I do? What can I do from here? This makes so much sense. Um, and I actually have a huge like influx of people in my course community now who found me through that interview and were like, finally, like a light bulb, you know, went off in their head and I'm not, and I'm still, I'm not at all knocking the vegan diet. Honestly, 
if someone is thriving on a vegan diet, this information is not for them. You know what I mean? Like it's my information is not for them. My course is not for them. Your course is not for them. Like if someone is happy- it's shocking to- how many people, <laughs> like yes. I mean, I'm right there with you. Maybe not 70 emails a day, but a whole lot of Instagram messages, YouTube comments, emails to me being like, I finally decided to eat some meat and like listen to what you've been saying. And I feel so much better. Um, yeah. Totally. So it's really shocking just how many people will live for a long period of time, continuing to eat a vegan diet and feel like crap. And what's dangerous is that then this is what I did. I personally was like, okay, I'm eating a quote unquote, well-balanced vegan diet. And I was like, okay, feel like crap. I bloated all the time. My digestive system's a mess. Don't have my period, which I mean, I also had anorexia too. So it's always kind of a little mixed, but, um, felt really bad. So then I was like, okay, well I need to become raw vegan. Right. And then Mm. when raw veganism didn't work, I was like, I need to become a fruitarianist. Like I need to just (laughs) eat fruit. And so it's a dangerous, and then it got into cleansing. It got into detoxing, got into all of that. And I see a lot of people just uh, adopt stricter and stricter vegan diets instead of just understanding that it is the lack of animal products that they have in their diet that is causing all of these symptoms. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, one of the bigger arguments that someone might like, someone might be on the fence with veganism, right. Listening to this and hear this and think, well, I thought that everything that you could get from an animal based diet, you could get from a plant based diet. But even if that were true, we know not, and I don't even know a vegan that would argue with me here. We know that animal foods are more bioavailable. We know that they're easier to digest. We know that they don't have things like plant toxins and anti-nutrients attached to them that can bind with our own minerals and make them unavailable to our bodies. I don't know that a lot of people would argue with that. So it comes down to maybe more of an ethical argument with, with people sometimes. And in which case, um, I talk about this in the interview, but I just said like, you know, I grew up in Texas and I grew up, you know, having friends who hunted and fished. And then I got into hunting because I wanted to myself. Um, my family didn't grow up as hunters. And then I got into spearfishing and I felt like I was connecting to a part of myself that I had never experienced before. It was the most primal and natural feeling I had ever. It's like my body was always meant to be doing that, but I just hadn't discovered it yet. And um, something that I explained on the interview is growing up around friends who hunted and fished, there was always somebody in the family that didn't like to do the hunting. There was always somebody in the family that didn't want to go skin the deer or go, you know, fillet the fish. Like, I'm not saying that everyone out there needs to be going and killing animals and fish and, and watching all of it. But what I am saying is that I think if we lived in a more communal style, we would realize that it's not everyone in the world that doesn't want to be doing this. My, my husband loves the process of skinning a deer and processing a deer. And, um, it's just, I think that it is a disconnection with nature and a disconnection with communities that has brought us further and further away and more into the vegan lifestyle. And interestingly, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think where big cities where veganism has thrived have been a little bit away from more rural areas, right? They're, They're in bigger cities. So that does make sense to me. I love that you were making this point right now because that's something I felt um, and have thought about for such a long time, especially after leaving veganism. Um, It's just the idea of like, wow, we are so disconnected from just like being an animal, from being like in nature that we, you know, think that it's so wrong to, yeah, go and like kill a deer, cook it, like do all of that. Um, and I know a lot of vegans are right now really hate me for saying this, and they really, um, I know it's a sensitive topic, but just hear us out here. I think this is a good point where it's like, we never, like, we don't go to the zoo and look at a lion and be like, oh my gosh, how dare you eat the steak that they just fed you? Like, no lions, they hunt, they kill. That's what they do. Um, and so all of us, every single animal we have our certain food that we eat and, uh, yeah, it's, it just kind of shows how disconnected we are, where we have this, I don't know how to explain this. We have this like weird relationship with eating other animals or killing other animals, which obviously, well, yeah, I don't know. It, it's just, it's the circle of life. I kind of just came to the yeah. like, like acknowledgement and understanding of this is how life works. 
Um, And I know a lot of people are not at that place yet, but I know for me, it finally just felt really natural to be back at that place. Well, I think it's just been so fascinating to hear because I, I, I wouldn't think that, um, you know, from knowing vegans personally, I would say that they, and they've expressed this, they feel that there is um, a level of knowledge, wisdom, or innate knowing that everyone is not there yet, right? They believe that like everyone is going to at some point make the connection and, and switch to veganism. They're just not there yet. And my introduction into veganism was actually through ex-vegans and people like Matt Blackburn. And um, I didn't know any vegans before I like got connected to people like that. And so hearing their story of being, being vegan for five, 10, 15 years, feeling great until they didn't feel great. Um, and then with blood, sweat, and tears being like, I will do anything to stay vegan. Like I'll do, I'll do anything. And to hear them on the other side going, whoa, okay, I don't know all the answers. I thought that I had reached the highest level of like knowing. And it turns out that there's this whole other camp over here that believes the exact same thing. And that like veganism is like not awake. You know what I mean? It's like it, everyone believes That's the opposite. You know, like it, they, 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 they each are kind of like um, believing that the other side just doesn't know yet. Um, and I think that's a fascinating part of the humanity of it, of just like, I don't know, it's something that I always just find. I'm always just like, I kind of like, I love, I love seeing it because I'm just like, wow, everyone has such a good reason to believe what they believe, you know, and I have a lot of self-compassion for that. So I think what we can just say here is that, you know, instead of trying to logically pick a side here. I really think kind of going back to what you're saying, we have this beautiful thing called our own body and we get to experiment with it every single day. Um, mm-hmm. And so if you're, you are having those, and this is why I love, like I loved learning about like the metabolism and about how it works and how it functions and what's a sign of a good metabolism, the sign of a bad metabolism, because it made me really take a step back and go, okay, I have to just admit at this point that like I have a lot of signs that my metabolism is trash. Uh, so something needs to change in regards to my nutrition. Oh, I'm vegan right now. Okay. Let's, let's try adding in meat. What happens? Oh, five months later, I get my first period in 11 years. Like, sorry, (laughs) that's enough of a sign for me to say like, yeah, it's like, I'm not waiting for a research article to finally a hundred percent prove whether veganism or meat is like, which one's better. Right. I'm simply just living my life and listening to the symptoms my body's giving me. And at this point I've experimented enough because I've been on nearly every single diet for the past, like over a decade. Um, and now I really just, I'm, taking responsibility of my own health. I'm listening to my body every single day and I understand what makes me feel good and I understand what makes me not feel good. And I think that this is something that all of us need to do, but we need to not fear when our body's telling us that it's not good. I think that's where a lot of people get stuck. They're like, I'll listen to my body, sure. But I'm like, are you? Because you're not sleeping. You have all of these issues, right? Um, And so you got to remember that your body doesn't, it's not going to like one day knock on your door and be like, Hey, you're doing something wrong. Your body over time is just slowly telling you with all of these symptoms that like, Hey, something is wrong. And so you have to be willing to listen to that. Yeah. And not be, I think, you know, to be honest, I think that from, from listening to my friend, um, uh, Vanessa, who, who no longer is vegan and kind of like hearing her story, I think she was gaslighting herself for a long time and gaslighting her own like um, her ability own experience. to experience. <laughs> yes, her own experience because it's what she had observed other vegans do to other people that had gone back to eating meat online or uh, you know like there's just a lot of um, internet content about there of people picking apart people that have gone back to eating meat and, and trying to explain every reason in the book why that was not the right choice and. So I think when you're around that culture and maybe like you're used to, you're used to that, you almost disconnect the trust to be able to listen to your own body and you're kind of like judging yourself. And it's like, it's a whole emotional and mental like hurdle to get over. And I have, um, I have to say like, it must take an enormous amount of grace actually to be able to like grace for yourself to be able to get past that. I, I can't imagine. 
it's really hard, especially when everyone knows you as the vegan. Uh, that was very hard for me to kind of leave that identity and kind of a little bit awkward. Like the only way I can relate it to like another experience in my life is just when I left uh, the church that I grew up in is kind of that same like thing of I would like go into like a church event or see my family's like church friends and they'd be like, wait, are you Mormon anymore? I'd be like, no. <laughs> like I felt weird like I was like okay I'm just gonna have to admit that like you know truth out like no I'm not um and I felt like the same way when I left veganism where it's like everyone expected me to just be vegan and be the one that like you know ate salad for lunch um and yeah it was actually kind of fun with some people to just like be like oh I'll have the hamburger and they're like what the heck <laughs> like last time I saw you you were like you know, full on vegan. I'm like, yep, nope, not anymore. But it does, it takes a lot of uh, strength and a lot of confidence in yourself to be able to make a huge change like that. Well, I can relate to it with dairy because back when I was super anti-dairy, I kind of had this feeling of um, moral superiority over people that did drink dairy of just like, um, and this is just myself. I'm not saying other people struggle with this, but like I, it was almost just like, oh, you drink dairy. Like I just, just this feeling that I somehow knew better. Um, and here I am drinking dairy again and loving it and knowing it's nourishing my body. And maybe I'll change my mind in the future, but I just think, you know, me becoming less dogmatic over the years has been very healing for me in my maturation process. Um, but it's, I, I just can totally understand the feeling of just like feeling like you have all the answers and then being like, I understand nothing I understand nothing and I'm just here to learn it's such a beautiful like place to be at when you finally get to that place of like I'm gonna have a really open mind here and admit that even science guys we know like such a tiny little part about the human body it, in general the human body is like a miracle and a wonder to science like we don't understand why certain things happen we don't understand why someone you know who looks relatively healthy all of a sudden their wife dies and then they die a week later it's like we don't understand how someone could die of like heartbreak so there's just so many things that we don't understand about life in general this universe our bodies everything that I think the most important thing that we can do is to stay open-minded and to understand that it will change like you're a mother you've gone through multiple pregnancies now I'm sure your diet and how much you've eaten and stuff has changed it's adapted mm -hmm. uh to a different like part of your life well and what's so cool about that is I I think like, you know, in my, I just had always heard culturally that you're more depleted with each pregnancy. And like, I think I just accepted that of like, I'm going to be more depleted with each child. And yet I know I am more nourished the second time around with my second child than I was my first time around. And that's going to be my goal as I move forward. Like, how can I just continue to put more, pour more into my body, put more, um, you said the phrase earlier, something about like, putting money into the bank, into the bank account, like that kind of analogy of just like pouring into your body. I can't believe that I had an even better second postpartum experience with my first, because I knew I was more nourished and I know I'm going to even have an even better one with my third, because I've learned even more since then. And, um, it's a really beautiful opportunity and empowering opportunity as a mom to be able to be like, actually, I'm not gonna, you know, go do the whole McDonald's thing by my third pregnancy. Cause I just can't, you know, cook anymore. It's so empowering to be like, no, I have the ability to change everything about this child's health and the future generations after them just by my choices alone. And like, how, how cool is that? So it's a really, it's a really awesome thing about being a mom is like the opportunity to nourish yourself and then outpour to your family from there. Mm. I love it. Well, we could keep on talking for literally hours, <laughs> um, but I'm going to let you get back to your family. I guess if there's just one last little thing that you would love to uh, kind of just leave the listeners with. Um, yeah. Do you have anything in particular that pops up in mind? Yeah. Just from the theme of what we talked about, I think just what just popped in my head was just the ability to trust yourself. I talk about this a lot, but just like the ability to trust yourself that you're going to make the best choice for your body and that you can listen to your body and that you can get in tune with that is like something that it's it's a gift that not a lot of people have given themselves and when you give yourself that gift like that is the most sustainable way to make 
choices for life. Like knowing, giving yourself the gift of like al allowing yourself to trust yourself basically. Um, and like reclaiming that trust and that intuition because, you know, I don't know if this is mostly women that listen to this, but just like as a woman, your intuition is so strong and you just have to flex that muscle again. And so what I would let you guys walk away with is you can trust yourself that you know your body better than anybody. Um, only you have experienced what you've experienced and you um, can trust yourself that you are making the right decisions for, for your body because only you can listen to your body. So yeah, I'll leave you guys with that. I love that one last little thing, just because I think it's uh, really goes along with that. Not only do we have such a really beautiful relationship and connection to our intuition, but also to nourishment because we are the giver of nourishment to life. Mm -hmm. We feed the babies. Um, and so as women, we do have a very special connection with food. And so it's like tapping back into that and allowing yourself to have that beautiful relationship with it. Anyways, Corey, this was beyond amazing. I would love to even have you on potentially in the future again, because I feel like we could kind of go down multiple different paths. I'm kind of jealous that your podcast is like a, um, you have a co-podcaster with you, um, which <laughs> she's amazing as well. Fallon's amazing. But um, yeah, this was, this was great. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me on.